Okay, this morning, as we kind of, kind of come towards the close, only have one more message out of the book of James, but as we come towards the end of it, we're going to talk about an issue that maybe more than anything else challenges our faith. I mean, if, in fact, this particular issue, if we don't get a handle on this one, if we don't really learn how to, to, to grip and handle it, it, it can really do a number on our faith. It can just shut us right down. So what we're going to talk about this morning is something that, for some of of you believers, this might be something that's been a real problem for your faith walk. And maybe, you know, for some of you who are not believers, maybe this is the thing, this particular issue we're going to talk about, this is the thing that's kind of been the very reason why you haven't taken that step of faith and accepted Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior. And actually, this is so important, you know, James kind of began his letter at the very beginning in James chapter 1 about this particular issue. And now here towards the end in James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, you know, he's going to talk about a variation on that theme. The same thing, he's going to talk about suffering and pain, which you and I encounter as we're living in this world of ours. And really, there's just nothing like a stout dose of suffering and pain to just to shut down a person's faith. And, uh, you know, it it, it can do that. Well, well, why can it do that? Well, here's why. Because we we go through a time of real pain and real suffering. You know, it kind of raises a lot of questions in our minds. And two questions basically kind of boils down to God, why? And God, when? God, why are you allowing this terrible thing to come into my life? And God, when are you going to take it away? When is this going to be over? Now, some of you, you know, no doubt, I mean, I know, some of you right now are suffering uh, in some pretty significant ways right now. And and maybe you're suffering from some kind of a a nagging medical problem, and it's just hanging on. It doesn't seem to be going away. Maybe your family, maybe your marriage is just in utter turmoil. You know, maybe you're going through a time of financial pressures. Maybe you're suffering the death, you know, uh, of a loved one, the death of a marriage. Maybe you are just hurting all over because of some kind of major disappointment in your life. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to prepare you for some really difficult trial that he knows is heading your way. Well, whatever the case may be, every single one of us, as believers in Jesus Christ, this is something we've got to learn. We need to learn how we are going to respond to times of suffering and pain because either you're just coming out of a time of suffering and pain or you're in one or you're heading into one. That's just kind of the nature of life in this world. Now, what James does in this little passage, you know, these few verses we're going to look at, he's going to give us a two-word solution to the problem of suffering and pain. And let me just be right up front with you. You know, frankly, I mean... I, I, I just can't say it any other way. You're, you're not going to like the answer. You're, you're just not going to like it. I mean, it's not an easy answer. But this solution to you know, our response to how we're supposed to respond to suffering and pain, we should accept it. We really need, every one of us needs to accept this that God is teaching us because of, of three reasons. First of all, because this is the inspired word of God. I mean, this is not just Bill talking. This is not just even James talking. This is God talking through his servant James. He inspired James to write these precise words uh, but to, to minister to us and to thousands of people throughout the centuries. So that's a good reason for us to accept it. A second reason is because, look, the author here, James, he was the half-brother of Jesus. I mean, that gives him a little authority, doesn't it? I mean, he grew up with Jesus, you know, you know. James is, uh, they both had the same mom, but different fathers. Jesus' dad was, was God, of course. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. James' father was Joseph. So imagine this. Now, you ever thought about this? Here's little James, and here's little Jesus, and they're running around in the house, and all of a sudden they get in some big argument, and Mary comes, rushes in, says, no, stop, stop. And James looks up and said, okay, I guess Jesus is never wrong, is he? <laughs> Poor guy. Can you manage, imagine some of the dynamics going on in that household? That must have been amazing. But the point is, you know, James really didn't believe in Jesus all throughout his ministry. I mean, the miracles, the healing, the teaching, the life he lived, all that wasn't enough to convince James. And he probably thought, oh, great. Here's my perfect brother. And now he's running around the countryside telling everybody he's the savior of the world. Please. 
No, it wasn't until James saw his brother up there on that cross, and he saw his death, a bloody death, and then a few days later, he saw his brother walking around in his new resurrected body. It wasn't until that that he saw a dead man walking that he believed, and then he did believe. And he put his faith and his trust in, in, in Jesus as the Son of God, as the God-man. And, and, and he went out. He spent the rest of his life really ministering, particularly to, to Jewish people, trying to convince and show and teach them that, yeah, his half-brother Jesus, he really was the Son of God. And, and, and his death on that cross really did pay for all their sins. And so we should accept James's solution to the problem of suffering for those two reasons. And then there's a third reason. Why? Because, you know, James comes speaking out of his own pain. Okay, this isn't just theory for James. And, you know, he, he's talking, he's writing on behalf of a group of people who are being persecuted for their faith. The persecution in Jerusalem had gotten so bad, you know, after Jesus had returned uh, back to heaven. Hey, a lot of Christians just left. It's called the diaspora. They were dispersed, went all over the place. But some of them stayed, and James is writing to these persecuted Jewish Christians who are going through a lot of persecution, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And so, with that background in mind, James comes to us and he says that the way that we are to respond to pain and suffering in our lives, here it is. Are you ready? The way God wants us to respond to pain and suffering is two words. Be patient. Be patient. Well, that stinks, doesn't it? I mean, be patient. That, that's what you say when you don't really have an answer. Be, be patient is when, you know, you're confronted with a tough situation and you don't really know the answer. So says, well, I guess we just need to be patient. Be patient. You know, that, that's what mom and dad would say to you when you wanted something really bad and they said, no, we can't give that to you right now. Just what? Be patient. That's not an answer. Be patient is just putting off the answer. And then look how far James is putting off the answer. Be patient then, brothers, until when? Until the Lord's coming. Whoa, that could be a long time, huh? A long time. You know, you're probably sitting there and saying, well, let's see. It's about, you know, 10 after 11. I'll be patient for another 20 minutes until Bill gets through with his message. Or I'll be patient another day. I'll be patient a week. I can be patient a month. But patient until Jesus comes back? Good grief. That, that, that's not an answer. I want a solution to my problem right now, today. I want God to come in here and take care of this thing now. Yeah, that's kind of what we think sometimes, you know. Because it is, this is a tall order. This is not an easy thing to be patient in the midst of suffering and pain. Just not an easy deal. So how do we do it? That's what we want to look at this morning. From this passage, we want to look at eight things that can really help you and me to, to learn to be patient right smack dab in the middle of, of times of suffering and times of pain. First of all, you know, when you think about, in general, all the suffering pain in the world, you think about the ravaged lives of these poor people who've gone through earthquakes and floods and hurricanes. You look at the Northeast, but these people are still suffering because of Hurricane Sandy. And, and you think about starving children going to bed hungry every night. And you think about all the murders and the rapes and people get, uh, get away with all kinds of stuff. And one thing that helps us to be patient is to accept that the ultimate solution to pain and suffering in this life is not found in this life. Okay, it's just not. Why? Because we live Make no mistake about it. We're living in a fallen world. This is not the world God created to be. This is a, a world that's the result of man rebelling against God and his lordship in, in everyone's lives. This is a world, guys, that is just, you see it on the paper. Well, we used to see it in the paper. We don't have one anymore. But, you know, the headlines. Uh, I mean, this is a terrible world. And we've got a war-ravaged world, which no amount of peace talks is ever going to really be able to bring any kind of lasting peace. We're living in a crime-filled world which no amount of law enforcement is ever going to be able to contain. And we're living in a world of sickness and death that uh, virtually an army of millions and millions of doctors could not even begin to, to take away. This world's not heaven. Don't ever think it, it, it is or can be because it never will be because, you know, this world is always going to have pain and suffering in it until, what, Jesus comes back. And makes things right. So James says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. 
So the second thing, then, that helps us to be patient in the face of suffering and pain, this one's found in, in the second part of verse 7 and, and verse 8, where James says this. If you have your Bibles, James chapter 5, 7, and 8. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You, too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So James is saying, okay, you persecuted Jewish Christians or, you know, you're going through a rough time. This is really bad. You're suffering. Something terrible has happened to you. Well, hold on a minute. Before you completely lose it and get bent completely out of shape, you need to realize, you need to see that you can't always see what's going on. You know, there's something going on a lot of times beneath the surface that you don't really know about at all. There's something, you know, that God might be doing behind the scenes that you don't know about, that you can't even dream about, that is really none of your business. And so just like the farmer, he takes you and looks at this, this uh, field, this plowed field, and he goes out and takes some seeds, and he, and he plants it in the ground, and he leaves it there, and he just, what? He waits and waits and waits for the autumnal, you know, the seasonal rains to come. The rains come and waters that seed underneath there. So you can't see a thing still. You know, and then finally, finally, something starts happening, you know, the seed interacts with the soil, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, whoop, you've got a little sprout, you know, coming up out of the soil. And that little sprout grows and grows and grows, and then finally becomes a very good and valuable crop. So James says, look at the farmers. Okay, that's where you need to be. So you two, like farmers, need to just back off Hold on a second, wait a minute, and be patient. Why? Because God is often up to something that you can't always see. You know, that God has a reason for letting you not get that promotion. You know, that he's using that painful conflict you're going in uh, with that person to kind of build up a, a character quality that he wants to build up into you and make you become more like Christ. And he's taking that tragedy. That, that's just inexplicable in your life. And, and somehow, some way, it's not beyond his control. He's using it to form you. He's using it to work uh, some kind of good for you, even in that painful situation. So how can we be patient in the face of suffering? Number two is, like the farmer, be patient, trusting that God is up to something underneath the surface that you can't always see. Verse 8. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, let's be honest. When we hear James saying, be patient because the Lord's coming is near, we think, uh, it's easy to think, oh, James, okay, I don't know about this one. You know, you wrote this 2,000 years ago. I'm sorry, Jesus hadn't come back yet. How can you say the Lord's coming is near? Well, it is near in this regard. Do you know that right now, there's absolutely nothing keeping Christ from returning right now? In other words, you look at the prophetic calendar, you know, all the prophecies of the things that have to happen before Jesus comes back, they've all happened. You know, you look at all the different signs, different things, well, this has to happen before Jesus returns. All that has happened, and so what that means is at any moment, at any time, right now, I'd love if I couldn't even finish this message before Jesus came back. It could happen. But, uh, but when he does return, guess what? Every tear from your eyes over all the suffering and all the pain that you've been through is going to be wiped away. That's a promise from God's word. And so when we view our present time of, of suffering and pain through that lens, that lens of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, it helps us to be patient. You know, as we're singing that song this morning, it is wealth, my soul. Uh, the verse 4 says, this is, what, this is what this guy did. Some horrible things happened in his life. But one of the things that helped him to say, it's wealth, my soul, the, the, and Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds will be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall sound, and the Lord shall descend. Even the, He's talking about when Jesus comes back. And that's something that kept him going. That's something that kept his equilibrium. That's something that enabled him to say in the midst of utter chaos and turmoil in his life, it's still well with my soul because he's coming back. He's coming back. Okay, number three then is live each day with the conscious hope that at any moment Jesus could return and wipe away your tears. That's good news, isn't it? All right, number four has to do with how we relate to each other 
when we're going through some tough, tough times. And at these times, we really need to, to work on being patient with each other. And that's why verse 9, James says, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, he, James is hitting on something that we know is true, right? Isn't it true that when you're going through a tough time, when there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, you know, that it's possible for that pain and suffering to drive a wedge between you and somebody you love? Between, you know, you and a friend or you and your wife or you and your husband or somebody like that? Now, let, let's say you're married and you're having some financial pressures. And that financial pressure, maybe it's not your fault, it's not her fault, it's not his fault, and yet, man, things are getting really tight. And the tighter it gets, the more the pressure's mounting and mounting, and, and you know, and, and, and you start to worry, and you start to worry about your future, and, and, you, and tempers start flaring, and then what do, you, what do you start doing? You start complaining, when you start griping against each other, you start grumbling against each other. Well, if you just had a better job that made more money, we wouldn't be in this big mess. Oh, yeah, well, if you had, hadn't bought all that stuff for the credit card and run up that big bill, we wouldn't be in such a mess. And before you know it, you know, that pain and that suffering resulting from the financial pressure it drives a wedge between you and, and your wife or your husband. And James is very aware of, of this, this dynamic. And so he says, don't, in this context, don't grumble against each other. So number four for your outline is don't let suffering drive a wedge between you and the people you love. Instead, be patient with one another. And then what James does in this passage is he he, he points to a couple of illustrations of people of patience uh, from the Bible. Well, why does he do that? Well, here's why he does that. Because, you know, human beings, our tendency is for us to say, Well, this is crazy. What do you mean? Nobody can be patient in the middle of of suffering and pain. In fact, I I imagine there's some of you here right now, and and, and you're you're sitting here this morning, and you're listening to all this stuff about being patient and all this stuff that's going on, and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, right, Bill, right. I mean, Bill, if you heard my story, if you knew the kind of suffering I'm going through, then you'd say to me, oh, well, this patience I've done apply to you, of course. I mean, of course, with what you're going through, nobody could possibly expect you to be patient. No, what you need to do, you just need to be mad at God. I mean, you're under such a rough time, you get a pass from this patient stuff. That's kind of how we think sometimes. So, so James says to his audience, kind of anticipating this, he says, look, okay, let me give you a couple examples of some people in the Old Testament who in the midst of incredible suffering, of incredible pain, were still patient. Verse 10, brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, and really that's what this passage is about, patience in the face of suffering. Okay, that's what we're talking about. As an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. James says, hey, remember the prophets? And who was the audience he was addressing? Who were they? The what? The Jewish people. Right. Did Jewish people know anything about prophets? Oh, yeah, from ever since they were knee-high to a grasshopper, they'd heard all about prophets. Prophets are kind of the, the, the Jewish people's heroes, okay? And so it says, remember the prophets? Well, here's the typical prophet scenario. This is kind of usually how it rolls with a prophet. I don't think any of us would really relish being a prophet. And uh, things would be going along pretty well in the country. You know, Israel might be having a time of prosperity. You know, everybody's doing okay. And, and, and some Old Testament prophet would walk up to the king, and he'd say to the king, you have fallen away from God. You and your people after you are worshiping these idols, and if you don't get your act together, if you don't repent of this stuff, you don't start obeying God and following him, things around here are going to get real, real nasty. And the king would say, oh, really? Well, I don't think so, and uh, really, I don't want you around here uh, raining on my parade. Guards, and off he goes to prison. Toss him in prison, you know, and he's in there for a day or a week or a month or whatever. And, 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 you know, he's in that prison until he can deliver a much more pleasant prophecy, a prophecy that, that gives the king warm fuzzies. Oh, king, you're so great, and this is great. That's what he's waiting for. And he waits there, and he's in the prison for, for years maybe simply because what? Because he had delivered the message to the king 
that God had given him to deliver to the king. And so these prophets, they would maintain their, their, their faith. They would retain their, their trust in God in spite of their suffering, in spite of the unfair treatment that they were going through. And eventually, sure enough, guess what happens? God shows up, and guess what? Things happen exactly as the prophet had predicted they, they would, and all of a sudden, the prophet's a hero. Oh, yeah, he was a man of God. Yeah, he was speaking the truth. Look at this. So James says, remember the prophets. Look at the prophets. Here's a great example for you. Remember for how time, you know, they came around and said this stuff, and, and everybody thought they're foolish, they're crazy. Are you kidding? Everybody thought at first, whoa, that, that can't be right. This, this prophet, he's out to lunch. And they think, oh, your, your faith is in vain, old prophet. You, you just didn't get it right. And, you know, you're waiting for God to do something that he's never going to do. And then, you know, James says, remember how God would finally come through and he'd do exactly what he said he would do. And then all of a sudden the prophet turns out being the smartest person in the world. James says, look at those guys. Look at those guys. Look at how faithful they were, even in the midst of terrible, terrible persecution. Look at how patient they were able to be. And look at how God was faithful to them and how God came through for them. And God did eventually do exactly what he said he would do. And James says also, look, just like God came through, you know, for the prophets, you know, in their time of suffering, he'll do that for you too. He'll do that for you too. So be patient. Be patient. Number five, then, is like the prophets, unswervingly believe that whenever God says something is going to happen, eventually it will happen. It's going to happen. And then James gives us the most amazing example of all, and uh, he says in verse 11, As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. And you've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And this is a great example because nobody suffered as much as Job did. I mean, maybe you're going through a rough time, but let me tell you, stacked up against Job, it's not anywhere near as bad because he lost it all. I mean, he lost it all. He had 10 kids, lost them all. Can you imagine a funeral with 10 caskets lined up? Unbelievable. Every one of his material possessions. He didn't just go bankrupt. He lost it all. You know, his health destroyed. He had terrible health. He was in all kinds of pain. He was sitting in an ash heap with boils all over his, over his body, scraping with a piece of broken pottery. This guy was suffering. He was suffering big time. Was this a picnic for him? No. Did Job enjoy this? Not at all. It was a miserable time. He didn't like it, and he had a lot of questions. He had a lot of complaints, but guess what? He never rejected God. Never did. His wife said, hey, why don't you just put an end to this, curse God, and die. Never did that. Never did that. In spite of the terrible suffering, in spite of the awful pain he went through for a long time, you know, he remained faithful. And you know what? As readers today of the book of Job that God has inspired uh, in that book to be written, that we might be able to read it, we can see that God was working underneath the surface of the situation. God, we can see from our vantage point today there, there was some stuff going on behind the scenes that Job didn't know. You know, God was doing some things that he didn't know about. God was doing some things that nobody at the time understood, and Job didn't understand at the time. In fact, a lot of people think the book of Job is, you know, this is the, answers the question of why do we suffer. No, it doesn't. I, I, Job, Job never is told this is why you are suffering. So, never hears that. He'll hear that in heaven, but he, he never heard that. And what did God do? He just showed up. He just showed up and he showed Job what a mighty, awesome, powerful, all-knowing, infinite, mind-boggling God that he was. And that was enough. That was enough for Job. And Job accepted it. And he just said, okay, I don't have to understand everything. And so Job finally, you know what he did? He let God be God. Let God be God. And that's number six on our list this morning for us to do. We want, you know, how do we be patient? Woo, number six, like Job, learn to let God be God. Now, I think this is one of the things that, that just helped us through Bill's whole cancer, cancer ordeal, uh, one of the most. Just to realize, to know, hey, look, God is God, we're not. God's in control as God, we're not. God's calling the shots, we're not. 
And, and we knew that God loved us. We knew that God cared about Bill. And, and we knew that Bill suffered a lot. And it was tough. And it was not a picnic, but we always knew, always, 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 that God definitely was still in control. As the psalmist says, our times are in his hands. We didn't understand why all that was happening. Won't understand that really till heaven, but, but we, we didn't have to understand. That, that's, nothing, that's nothing we can demand. That's God's business. And no doubt, God was doing all kinds of things behind the scenes. And no doubt, there's a lot of stuff under the soil that God was doing. And somehow he's working this out together for our good. And in the midst of that pain and in the midst of the suffering, when you let God be God and trust that I don't understand it, but God, you understand it, there's a real peace there that's very difficult to even begin to describe. Number six is to learn to let God be God. And number seven is, in the midst of pain and suffering, maintain your trust in the true, unchanging nature, unchanging nature of God. Because what is this God with this unchanging nature like? He is full of compassion and mercy. Here's, here's one way I like to think about this uh, every once in a while. You know, uh, let's say you're having this big old Louisiana thunderstorm. I mean, it's a big one, you know, and the dark clouds and it's rumbling and the lightning's flashing and you're kind of looking, waiting to see a, see a tornado pop down at any time. And man, it's noon and it's dark outside. But guess what? The sun's still shining. It, it, you can't see it, but it's, the sun has not diminished even a little bit. It's shining as brightly as it was when this, it shines on a bright, beautiful, clear day here on earth. But you can't see it because you've you got that storm's kind of blocking the way. Well, listen, that's the way it is with us. Sometimes we go through some storms. Oh, man. And it's an earthquake or it's a, it, it's a, a bad, bad storm. And it's dark. Things seem really dark. But guess what? God hadn't changed. He hadn't changed. He's still the same God. He's still the same God when, when, when you're enjoying blessings from him, and he's still the same God when he's allowing you to go through some tough times. He's still compassionate. He still loves you to death, literally, because he's willing to die for you. No, nothing changes that. So in the midst of pain and suffering, maintain your trust in the true, unchanging nature of God. Final thing that helps us to be patient in the face of suffering is number eight. Be patient, I love this, since there are no other good options. <laughs> there really, I mean, we, we logically think through this, hey, there just aren't any other good options. So let's consider three options. Number one, options, well, number one you can have, you're, you're in pain and suffering. You think, since there's pain and suffering in the world and in my life, God does not exist. It's kind of the old, well, how could a loving and good God allow these terrible things to be happening well, I'm not going to attempt to unravel the problem of evil in this world in the next three minutes. But listen, this is what, just for the sake of what we're talking about this morning, listen to this. If, if the problem for you is that there can't be a God because, hey, look at all the pain and suffering in this world, guess what? All you've proven is that, hey, that the God, that you would, as you would like him to exist, doesn't exist. That there is no such God. In other words, your God, which you've kind of come up with in your mind, you know, apart from Scripture, and you've imagined, no, this is the way God, God must be. That God, really, you're right. He, he doesn't exist. And, you know, what happens? You, you just kind of printed up a picture of God. You know, and you've kind of written out a little job description. Okay, job description for God. You must do this and this and this, and this is the way you ought to be, and this shouldn't happen, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and then you've got your picture of God, and you go out looking for that God. Guess what? He's not there. He's just not there. There is no such God. There's only one God, the God of the Bible. So you, you've torn up your picture then. You, you don't like that picture. It's not working, so you just tear it up and you throw it away and you conclude, well, well, there's just no God. God doesn't exist. Now listen, this is so important. Just because you and, and your imaginary God, which you've created in your own mind, doesn't exist, that has nothing to do with the existence of the real God. You know, you're trying to squeeze the all-knowing, infinite, almighty, all-powerfully, perfectly holy, perfectly loving, you know, infinite God down into your little finite 
human box that your little pinochle brain has somewhat come up with, that, that doesn't work. That's impossible. Let me tell you, don't miss this. There is something a whole lot worse than being disappointed with God, and that is being disappointed without God. Oh, man. Going through life's tragedies, going through some of the tough stuff we've got to go through without God there, without the real God of the Bible, you know, him as your redeemer, him as the rock, him as your refuge, him as your comforter to help you through those times. Oh, man. That's infinitely worse. So, option one doesn't work. God doesn't exist. Well, let's let's look at the second option we have in the face of pain and suffering. Number two, God does exist, but since there's pain and suffering in the world, I'm mad at him and I don't like him. And this is just kind of, well, God is not acting the way that I want him to act, and if he really loves me, blah, 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 blah. And now, you know what we've done then? What we've done then is we're trying to to give God marching orders. Trying to tell him, God, do this. Snap. Right now. And and God, here's how you have to act. And you've got to act this way. You've got to do this to please me because really it's all about me. And so when God says, no, thank you, I'm God and you're not. Well, Well, then we say, well. If that's the case, and I'm mad at you, I'm angry at you, God. It's not fair. And I'm going to take my ball of my uh, obedience and faith. I'm I'm out of here. I'm gone. Okay, that's option number two. How's that working for you? What does that accomplish? What what good does that do? I mean, have you solved the problems of the world? You know, everything gone away because you're mad at God? Does the pain go away? No. You know, is there, is there less tragedy in the world, less rapes and murders and earthquakes and starving children aren't, aren't going to, to bed at night hungry? Is that all happened because of that option? No, it hasn't changed a thing. What has changed is you've turned your back on the only being, the only person in the universe that can possibly make any kind of sense out of all the pain and the suffering that you've gone through. And let me tell you, 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 just, you do that, you're just going to spend the rest of your sad, pitiful life disappointed and disillusioned. That is not a good option. It just doesn't do a whole lot for you. Really, the only option that works, when we're facing pain, we're facing suffering, the only uh, option that works is we just fall humbly before God. And we come before him and say, God, I don't like this that I'm going through. But you're God that I'm not. And you're God not in made in my image, and and you're not interested in the marching orders that I'm giving you, and and you're not interested in this picture I've printed up with you, which is false. You don't don't really, my job description really doesn't mean a whole lot, and so God, I'm just going to be patient. I'm just going to continue to love you. I'm going to continue to serve you, and sometimes I'm going to be mad at you, and sometimes, a lot of times, I'm not going to know what in the world's going on, but that's okay, because you're God and I'm not. And so I'm just going to patiently wait for you to accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish in my life through this time of suffering. Option number three, then, the only good option available is in the face of suffering, I will be patient, trusting that God loves me, that he knows what he's doing, and that he will get me through this in his perfect time and in his perfect way. And that is how... The man who wrote that song, It Is Wealth, My Soul, his wife, his children had been recently drowned. And he was still able to say, It's wealth, my soul. Why? Because he knew God was God and he wasn't. And he knew that even in spite of this, God hadn't changed. He's still the same loving, almighty, compassionate, merciful God that he's always been. And so he could say, It was well with his soul. So, guys. How are we supposed to respond to suffering and pain? Be what? Be what? Patient. One more time. Be patient. patient. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just uh, come before you this morning, and you know exactly where all of us are. You, you know, there's some real suffering, Lord, going on in, in the lives of some people right here in this room. And, Lord, we confess, we know that you're aware of every ounce of that suffering and every ounce of that pain. And, Father, we just 
we just confess that we get so impatient with you. And yet, Lord, you're so patient with us. And we thank you for that. And Father, th- this is just not an easy message. And, and, and patience, Lord, in the face of suffering, it, it's just not something that we naturally do. But we thank you, God. We thank you for your word this morning. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope and the light that it can bring into the dark chapters of our lives. And Lord, I pray that this morning for, for people right here in this room who are right now in the midst of some kind of terrible suffering, folks, some, God, somebody who's is appearing, experiencing a lot of pain, whether it's mental or physical or, or emotional, oh, God, would you bring them comfort? Would you help them to have the quiet, calm assurance in their hearts of your love and your concern for them, even in spite of the very painful and very difficult time they're going through? God, we thank you for your patience with us. Strengthen our faith, Lord. Help us to be able to be patient when the unwelcome guests of suffering and pain come knocking on the door of our lives. Help us, God, to remain faithful. Help us to not grow apart from you in bitterness, but to grow closer to you as we look only to you, Father, to be our comforter and our rescuer, our rock and our refuge in this torn and fallen world. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.